This is One on One. Hi folks, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studios right here in beautiful Lincoln Center. Um, I want to welcome our, for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. I want to welcome Marin Ireland. I cannot believe people get that name wrong. It is so easy. <laughs> She's an actress, and she's playing in The Big Knife right now, which is in the Roundabout Theater Companies at Big Knife uh, at the American Airlines Theater. Uh, by the way, you are playing with one of our favorite performers, Bobby Carnival. Set up what The Big Knife is and why people should go see it. Sure. It's um, set in Hollywood in 1949, um, and Bobby's character is a very, very famous um, movie star of the big old, good old Hollywood golden era. Um, and you are? And I am his wife, who is not in the business. Um, I, I like to think that she's not your typical long-suffering wife, but she is sort of your long-suffering wife. Um, she's uh, separated from her husband at the moment when the play That's begins. Two of you right there. Yeah, me right. and Bobby. Bobby Carnival from yeah. uh, a whole bunch of things. I said right before we got on the air, we saw him on Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Mm -hmm. We had the director here, but also from uh, Boardwalk Empire. Yep. Um, and, and set this up a little bit more. As you're talking about the play, yeah. he brought you in. Yeah, yeah, Bobby. We did a reading of the play about a year ago, and Bobby and I have known each other and wanted to work together for a long time, and um, he he wanted me to come in and be a part of the reading, and uh, it was uh, we hit it off in those roles. It was great. It's Tip a great kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good kind of old bogey Bacall kind of feeling to our, our characters. They're a real, real match for each other. And But basically, Bobby's character is trying to get out of the studio system, um, and he's kind of caught in a, uh, in a tough spot. An ethical, moral yeah, conundrum. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to give anything away. No, no, but, not but too he's, much. He's grappling with some big demons. Um, speaking of demons. Yeah. I don't have no segue. I have no segue. <laughs> I just realized I had absolutely no segue for that. I thought I had a, uh, an easy one. Let's do this one. Uh, as we go back, I'll go back to the play in just a little bit. Let's talk about your background. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Southern California. I don't say Marin County. I did not. <laughs> Southern California. Easy. But but the county is helpful for people to remember how to pronounce my name. Southern California. But yeah. Uh, outside of L.A., um, in kind of a small town, Camarillo, which used to be famous for the state mental hospital being there. Uh, it's no longer there, um, but it's kind of a, a little farm town uh, in Southern California. How did we get you in New York? Gosh, that is a good question. I, I, went I don't to have college. answers. I, just have questions, <laughs> I, so. I went to college in Hartford uh, at the Hart School. Um, I was in the first class of their theater program there, and started coming to New York every weekend and seeing shows and just then, seeing shows. Yeah, and then um, and then couldn't get me away. It was it felt like the right place for me. I mean, I was I grew up far enough outside of L.A. that I I really didn't have a, a deep connection to that place or the way kind of the the um, business worked in L.A. Did not. I didn't know. I mean, I was about an hour outside of uh, L.A. proper, so it didn't really feel um, uh, much like I really had a foothold there. Acting bug? Since I was a kid. Okay, yeah. hold on. You got you had the acting bug as a kid. Yeah. But when you're out in L.A., yeah. the bug is not manifesting itself. Well, you know, I was doing theater. I was doing, like, community theater stuff when I was a kid, and... Um, so I never really did that thing that I, I know a lot of people did when they were that age, if they really got into it, had their family drive them, mom drive them to like, you know, commercial auditions or whatever. I was doing a lot of community theater stuff and really, you know, intense on Shakespeare and all the classics. So it didn't really translate to kind of the, what I thought of as L.A. at that time. You know what I mean? I wanted to be in New York and, and Broadway and, um, and real kind of theater stuff when I was a kid. First paid gig. Uh, well, um, I, I was doing like lots James of summer Lipton. stuff. I know. <laughs> I did a lot of summer stuff. I had these stock. cards that I started doing. <laughs> um, when I was in college, I was doing a lot of summer stock. So um, I was doing, like, little parts in Pygmalion and these crazy plays like Hobson's Choice. You know, one Oh, you really scene. are talking about the classics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where did that come from for you? A lot Gosh, of reading as a know, kid? Lots of reading. I was, I was, when I was real, you know, like nine, ten years old, just couldn't, couldn't keep the books out of my hands. And I wanted to be a writer before I got in, you know, when I was a little kid, writing lots of like stories and, and then, um, and then community theater. I kind of, I loved reading all those plays and, and being a part of them. I actually, you know, what was last at the roundabout was Picnic, which when I was 13, I did a production of Picnic playing Millie, 
the younger sister, and that changed my life. And oh. Millie, Millie wants to, in the play, go to New York. And, but that was the first time I really remember having a really profound reaction to doing a, sh doing a play and it feeling like, this is my life. This is me. I had an older sister. You know, I was a tomboy. I was reading all the time. And I kind of was like, William Inge, he understands my life. He understands me. And I could really put my experience into a role. And that was the first time kind of it cracked open for me as to what that experience could be. It could be really transformative. This performance on Broadway, not your first. No. No, my first one was in the Neil Labute play Reasons to be Pretty um, in 2009. What'd you play in that? I played a girl, uh, <laughs> she's a hairdresser in a small town, <laughs> and, um, and um, her uh, boyfriend, she over has, has been informed of a comment that was overheard by him that she has a regular face and um, her, everything explodes <laughs> from there. And so the play starts. She's sort of uh, you know, figuratively burning the house down and, and walking okay. away. So let's fast forward <laughs> to Big Knife. Mm -hmm. Last performed on Broadway in 1949. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee Strasberg directed. It yeah, was the, the great. One and only. Yeah. yeah. What do you think took it so long to come back? That is such an interesting question because I think that the more I'm learning about Odette's and his career, I think that. Um, there was, which can happen to a lot of writers who are really prolific, is, you know, he had kind of what people considered his his best period, where it was Waiting for Lefty and Awake and Sing and these plays people really know about. And then the critics sort of turned on him, this play called Night Music that he wrote in 1941. And everything after that kind of fell into this period where he was, had kind of fallen out of favor with the critics. And so this play kind of uh, slipped through the cracks a little bit. There's a lot of plays of his, later plays of his, that um, weren't really, didn't really get the attention that his earlier stuff did, or, or his stuff during his kind of golden era. And your character's name, Marion? Marion. Marion yeah. Castle. Now you said that in the role as Bobby Carnival's wife in, in this, set in 1949, you said you're not the typical um, wife who is how did you describe it again? Long suffering. <laughs> but then you said you are long suffering. Yeah, I mean, are you, you know, or are you not she... suffering in this play? <laughs> well, I think uh, it's only because, you know, when you're playing these roles, you got to really advocate for them. And so I, I like to think of her as um, she's stronger than that. You know, she's got a real spine. Um, she's just trying to figure out how do you love a man who has succumbed to um, the worst parts of success, basically. He's, what does that mean? He's, well, he, first of all, he wants to succeed, but as I understand, as you read about the play, you don't yeah. want to give away too much. Yeah. He, he knows certain things. He's... He's being... Hold on. He's yeah. being protected. He's, mm -hmm. Something has happened. Mm -hmm. He's done something. The studios know what he has done. Mm -hmm. They are attempting to protect him to some extent, but in the effort to protect him, he makes some sort of Faustian deal. Right. And in the process, ethical, moral issues... Right. I mean, and, and as far as Marion is concerned, it's, it's gone a lot further back than, than any sort of single incident. As far as she's concerned, you know, when they got together, he was a, a Broadway actor in New Do York. Do you want him to make money? I did. She no longer places such a high priority on that because the kind of person he's become, mm. he's been out in Hollywood for 12 years and basically... He's he's been held hostage by the studio in a lot of ways. What does that mean? Well, you know, in he's this working old, in this old studio system, though, once you sign a contract with that studio, you only make movies for them. That's it. So you only do what they they tell you to do. It's like if you're stuck on a TV show for ten years. Right. That's all you can do. You can't do other things. And they've stuck him in these terrible movies. But he has to do them. And he has to do no them. No choice. And he can't do any other movies. So he's he's they been, own him. They own him. So he's doing these these terrible movies, you know, like these real like kind of they're they're giving him the worst movies to do, and he can't do anything else. And he's drinking, he won't he can't stop drinking. He's cheating on me, he's drinking, and he's like he loves this life, and who can blame him? He's making millions of dollars to basically be paid to like do terrible movies and sit around. So he's and become. You? She's trying. She, she doesn't work. She's trying to like. She loved the life certainly for a while, but he's become somebody she can't live with anymore. He's openly cheating on her. He's become a drunk. So getting nice things doesn't do it for you. Not anymore. She's sort of seen the difference in him since, and she's like, I don't like this guy anymore. I don't like him. He's he's not the person I married. You want out? I don't want to give away she, too much. Well, 
you know, it's really tricky because she wants out. She all right, wants all right, all right. I'm being she told to stop. Take, I'm being she told wants to take Georgette, him with her. You know, she, she. Did she want? Did she, did she want to make him be a better person? I mean, here's the thing, right? They, they, when they were in New York, when they first met and got married, it was all about kind of uh, this real idealistic thing. You know, we can change the world. With we're in art. this together. With art, yeah. I mean, it's like we. Her and, and they came out there with like writer friends of theirs and it was like he was discovered on Broadway by Hollywood. It was like we can change the world with art. You know, it was real idealistic and stuff. And now? And now. Business. Look, it's business. He Ugh. makes crummy movies, you oh, know? Oh, God. And, and, and the ending is interesting. The ending is very interesting. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and where can people see it? <laughs> At the American Airlines Theater on 42nd Street. Right across from the McDonald's. Let me ask you, uh, <laughs> real quick, Homeland, yeah. that little show? Yeah, <laughs> who knew? Who knew? But yeah. Did you know? I had no idea. Tell everyone your role and, and how it all happened. Gosh, well, similarly, I mean, it, it, she's a woman with a secret. <laughs> she's, um, <laughs> you haven't seen the show. Where can people find Homeland? Well, it was on Showtime, so I think you can watch it on demand, mm. uh, things like that. Um, yes, you can. Uh, I think I'll, even on iTunes. By the way, Homeland fans here, guys, Homeland yeah. fans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terry, you are our floor manager. And yeah. your character is? Uh, <laughs> Eileen, you know, she's got a secret. She's, you got issues? She's got some serious issues with this country. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. But interesting. Yeah. Can you relate? Yeah. I could relate. I oh, could relate, you can. sadly. I mean, not just to this, <clears throat> you know, my issues with the country, but, but um, you know, look, she's trying to make a difference. You know, what can I say? Was. Um, was. Oh. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but I did not have any idea that the show would kind of go on. And I also didn't know I'd, I'd, I'd come back How to season two. How do you not know? Two. Because, you know, when you get these jobs as an actress, you know, I hadn't read the pilot. And then they kind of say, okay, they want you to do four episodes of this show. You audition. You have three pages of sides. They don't give you the whole script. You know, you hear, like, it's Claire Danes' new show. There's lots of good shows that don't end up even going to air. You know what I mean? There's lots of good shows that never even get picked up. You, and it hits. Of, and then it hits, and you have no idea. You really can't know until the public kind of decides. You love your work. I do. One I to really ten? <gasps> Off the scale. All right, just checking. Yeah. Just want to make sure. <laughs> uh, Marin Ireland. Yeah. Actress that you can find uh, playing in The Big Knife as the wife of Bobby Carnaval, who plays Charlie Castle. You are Marion Castle. It's playing at the American Airlines Theater on 42nd Street. Go out and check it out. And also to be seen on a whole bunch of other terrific shows. Hey, listen, I want to thank you for joining thank us. We you. appreciate it. Don't be, let it be the last time you come see us in our studio. You got it. Thanks, all the best. Thanks so much. I'm Steve Adubato. This is the WNET Tish Studio. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. Thank you. Thanks. Well, if no one claims them, they'll be buried in a potter's field. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Sun National Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, United Water, County College of Morris, the Merck Company Foundation, and by Fedway Associates, Inc. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.